Hey, Center Point, we're so glad you joined us. Why don't we worship Jesus together? Whether you're at home, whether you're in your car, let's sing some songs to him. Let's do it. The 
God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lifted my With all creation cry God we praise you Yes we do The God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. My God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the
rejoices the lilies with beauty and splendor. How much more will he clothe you? How much more will he clothe you if he watches over every sparrow? How much more does he love you? in you today and forevermore and in Jesus name we say amen what's up everyone welcome to center point my name is Brett and I am so glad that you are here with us today very excited for today because we have a brand new sermon series that we are starting which is very timely very applicable to our lives all of our lives right now it's called peace out and we're going to be looking at how to find peace in God no matter what's going on in our lives or in the world around us so very excited about that today but before we move into that time of teaching I want to challenge us all here as as we're watching online in lots of different places to not do church alone and to take at least one step to connect with with other people here today the first thing that I challenge you to do is very simple you can share this service on your social media profiles very simple second thing might take a little bit more from you if you're a little more shy or a little more introverted but please let us know that you're watching by saying hi in the chat introduce yourself let us know where you're watching from we're here to pray for you answer any questions that you might have live so please check out our chat um, as a way to connect with us today. And the third thing is, if you're brand new, you're here for the first time, just checking out Centerpoint, we wanna say welcome and encourage you to check out our digital connect card. Fill that out with as much information as you want. We really just wanna know that you were here with us today and we'd like to connect with you this week. Again, to pray with you, answer any questions that you have. So those are the three things, guys. Share, them, share the service online, uh, check out the digital connect card and also participate in the chat. So let's take a step today to do church in community. And for those of us who are, are here, you're part of our online campus, uh, or you are a regular attender at one of our uh, six campuses, but you're here watching with us online today, I wanna say thank you for your continuous uh, generosity and your giving, and remind you that you can give today at cpchurch.com give. But if you're here checking us out for the first time, please just 
sit back, enjoy the service, um, and we're just so glad that you are here with us today. Last thing before we move to the message, um, we are in our time of, 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 of life groups here at Centerpoint, and it's very important for us as a online community to engage uh, with each other in community, as I've been saying, um, but I really wanna challenge us all here, especially for the online campus, to find a life group. I challenge you just for six weeks, six weeks this fall to find a life group and get plugged in. Be intentional about it. It's very important in our growth as Christians and our walk with God that we don't do it alone just watching videos online or watching videos on, on YouTube. Uh, it's very important that we are involved in each other's lives. So I want you to check out our uh, list of uh, life groups that are going to be starting. If you don't feel comfortable uh, meeting in person at one of our in-person life groups, we got you covered. We have digital groups. We have groups that offer accommodations for people who want to watch from home or join in through Zoom. So we have you covered and as far as that goes. We're going to keep everyone safe, keep everyone comfortable, but we want to keep everybody connected. So make sure you check out our life groups. If you have any questions about how that works or if you or finding one, I'm here to help you. Please email me at brett.faultless at cpchurch.com. I'll be happy to walk you through getting getting connected to a life group this fall. So with all that said, guys, let's move into our time of teaching. I'm very excited about this one. Please uh, enjoy the rest of the service, the rest of your day, and I'll see you in the chat. God bless. Join us this Saturday, October 16th for CP Farm Day for a time of family fun at Fink's Farm in Waiting River. From the hours of 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., you can enjoy fresh produce, a petty zoo, a hay ride, and more. Mark your calendars to join us this Saturday for CP Farm Day. Cost is $12 a person. Kids under the age of two are free. For more information, visit cpchurch.com slash events. Should I really sign up for a life group? What if the people there are weird? Everyone there probably knows each other already. My life is pretty busy. Isn't Sunday enough? If you're not part of a life group at Centerpoint, I'm sure you have a few reasons. But we want to strongly encourage everyone here at Centerpoint to try a life group for the next six weeks. Life groups are our loving environments where we learn about Jesus, we lend a hand, we laugh together, and we leave a legacy. These are the communities where we help you live for Christ and live like Him. These are the spaces where we help you become who God created you to be. And so I want to encourage you to try a life group for six weeks, just six weeks, and I'm confident that you will see that there is so much more to God, so much more to faith, and so much more to church than just Sunday. Good to be here. Good to have you with us here as uh, we're starting a brand new series today. If you're just joining us for the first time, my name is John. I have the great honor of being the campus pastor here at our Massapequa location. And I'm just excited about this series as we're talking about peace in turbulent times. How do we find peace? How do we apply peace to our lives when it feels like everything is crazy? And I, I think that where I want to start is just with a question. What comes to your mind when you hear the word peace? Maybe for you it's a location, so you think about a favorite vacation spot with the family that you get to go to. Uh, maybe for you it's just standing on the beach, you know, field six, just with your feet in the sand, staring out at the infinite expanse of water and just knowing that everything is going to be all right. Or maybe, like me, you're a parent, and so the bathroom is the place where you can hide out for a few minutes, and nobody knows that you're in there, and so you get a few minutes to yourself, and that's what you think of when you think of peace. 
Uh, maybe it's something to eat or something to drink. Maybe for you, it's a nice filet mignon, you know, like a nice 12 ounce. Maybe it's, a, you know, that deep forest fudge cake that they have at Grand Lux Cafe. Uh, for you, you're more of a, the sweet type. Or maybe it's like a stack of burgers at White Castle, in which case I'll pray for you um, because they may give peace in the moment, but they're going to come back and take that away from you in a little bit. Or maybe it's something to drink. You've got a nice glass of wine that you enjoy. Or maybe you're one of the pumpkin spice people at Starbucks that you're like, oh, I just love the fall. I love my pumpkin spice. Or maybe you're like me in a Pepsi with real sugar, cracking open a can of Pepsi with real sugar every now and again, which is impossible to find in New York. Uh, But that that brings you some sense of peace, some sense of reassurance that everything is going to be okay. Uh, there, There is a culture that we live in that has a thousand ways to try and sell us peace. A thousand different ways. There is just nonstop entertainment that for a little bit of time, you just turn on the TV, you just dial in, you lean into a whole season of Seinfeld or Friends or Scrubs, pick whatever you want, and all of the cares of the world, all of the stress, the blizzard of adversity that you face on a regular basis can just melt away while you're watching Seinfeld or while you're watching any of these other shows. Or maybe it's something technologically, some kind of possession. You know, you upgrade your house and the house looks nice and finally there's peace. Or if you get this car, you have this job, you have this amount of money, that that will bring you a sense of peace. You have this many friends on social media. Uh, Maybe it's getting one specific possession. You know, you think about kids being like, oh, I need to get an Apple Watch for Christmas and then I will feel complete, I will feel whole. You know, this amazing thing that saves you so much of the space, you don't have to reach in your pocket to see who texted you anymore. You can just turn your wrist over. It's amazing. All of that energy saved. It's worth its weight in gold. So we've got all these different things that promise peace. Relationally, it's never been easier to find the one or the one for tonight. Right? There's websites. There are apps. There are all these different ways of finding that special person who can make you feel like enough, whether it's for a weekend or whether it's till death do us part. And then especially lately, there's been a big press. I don't know if you felt it, but I've felt it. Social peace. This advertisement that if we just got this person elected, if we just got this piece of legislation passed, if we just got these people in society on board with this agenda, or these people in society, don't look into the the left and right thing that I'm doing here, uh, on board with this agenda, then everything would be fine. We would have peace. But we know that these things can't give what they promise, not in the long term, maybe for a little while. There can be, but not certainly any sort of lasting peace. And they cost something. They take something from us. There's an investment of time, of energy, of money required to experience these. And what happens when that peace runs off? We just turn the carousel up faster. We go back. We spend more. We invest more. Because once those shows are over and we head to bed, what happens? All of the things, the blizzard of adversity that we were facing, all of that comes rushing back to us. And then what do we have to do? we got to download an app to help us fall asleep. Anybody else? Right? And we know that's out there. And so the entertainment doesn't work. The possessions, they work as long as nobody else has more possessions than we do or gets the nicer version, the nicer car. You go on social media and you see that person from high school that was way beneath you in the rankings. All of a sudden, they're doing much better than you in life. And that takes away your peace. So that doesn't work either. Financially, where we live, especially, anybody's retirement account still trying to recover from 07, 08? A lot of us, that can, you can lose that in a phone call, you can lose that in a bad day. And so where is the lasting peace? Maybe for the moment, there's peace, but not certainly in the long haul. Relationally, yeah, sure, it feels good to be in that, in that new relationship feel, right? Those, those, those nice times where you just say, oh man, I just can't stop thinking about this person. That feels good, but that wears off. Even a romantic escapade over the weekend because you got an account on Tinder that wears off as well. Everything wears off. It's got, I said Tinder in church. Does that make anybody uncomfortable? I'm sorry. Um, It's out there. It's real. We got to address it. Some of you are on it. Um, There's this a real reality that these things have an expiration date. They cost us. They promise peace. They take from us. And yet they have an expiration date. And then even socially, here's what I would say very carefully. Um, Right now, one of the things I'm reading is on 20th century Soviet history. That's what I'm doing in my, my free time. But one of the things that is often promoted as peace when it comes to socially is the removal of the opposition. We'll have peace when we just get these people out of our society. You see that in 20th century um, Soviet history. And, And that is not peace. It may work for a little while, but then once you get all those people out of society, 
You start looking at these other people and be like, you know, I actually don't like them much either, either, because there's something broken within the human condition from which we need a savior that just doesn't, that just likes to lean into war and to conflict and to adversity. There is something within us that just doesn't allow us to play nice. Anybody who has kids knows this. You have a bunch of kids in a room, somebody's gonna get bit. Why? That doesn't happen. No, none of you probably are biting people at your house and yet kids just know instinctively, I don't like you, I'm going to bite you. There's something broken within us that will hamstring, that will just sap the strength out of any social pursuit. One historian joked about it this way. He said that peace is the time it takes for both sides to reload. And that is what we see when it comes to society, that whether socially, whether relationally, whether uh, economically, materially, even entertainment-wise, that there is a peace that is promised that costs us something and can't actually continue to give us peace in the long term. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, there's a prophet named Jeremiah, and he's talking about false prophets, people who are out on the streets promising peace, peace, when they have no ability to give peace. And this is not much different than our culture today. We see ourselves in the the same situation that those people did hundreds of years before Christ was born. Wouldn't it be great if there was a peace that was freely offered, that didn't cost you something because it already cost somebody else something, and it it was accessible, it was available at any time? A peace that was untouchable by our outer circumstances. A peace that was available to bring an inner calmness inside, regardless of what was going on in our outer world. A peace that could let us know, no matter what was happening, that everything was going to be all right. Wouldn't that be a great peace? It's available. And I want to prove that to you, and I want to prove even beyond the fact that it's available, that it is God's will for you to have today. John chapter 14 is where we're going to be, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If you're new to scripture, new to Christian faith, new to the Gospels, this is right after the Last Supper, so that's probably a pretty good cultural anchor point. Uh, This is right after Jesus is having his Last Supper with his disciples. Judas is left. He's on his way to go betray Jesus. All that's been set in motion. And this is Jesus' last few hours with his disciples. Now you imagine if you had a few hours knowing that you were going to die soon afterwards and you had this audience with the people that you love most in the world, what would you say to them? Wouldn't it be the things that were the most important? There would just be these recurring themes about how much you love them and that they're going to be okay and that this is the way that you want them to live. Those are the most important things that you're trying to leave them and impress upon them in your absence. And that's exactly what we find Jesus conveying to his disciples, to his followers. You've got this group of people that have been following Jesus for a long time, and while Jesus has been physically present, they've been mostly protected. But he's talked a lot about how he's not going to be physically present much longer, and that the world around them is going to be very, very hostile. And so they are nervous, they are concerned, they are worried, they are afraid, they are troubled. Because what happens to them? How do they know that everything is going to be all right if Jesus isn't physically present with them? So you've got people following Jesus in a culture that is hostile to those following Jesus who are worried about how to live in a way that is peaceful while he is absent. I would say that that's the same condition that all of us are in. We're people who are aspiring to follow Christ. We're doing the best that we can to follow Christ He's not physically present with us. And we live in a culture, in a world that is hostile towards our faith. And so how do we live? How do we find peace? And Jesus is going to give this to us in John chapter 14, verse 27. And we're going to bleed a little bit into verse 28 because they're not supposed to be disconnected. Uh, This is Jesus' words. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives, Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away, and I am coming back to you. The one thing I want everybody having resonating in their minds when they leave here today, if if there was an earworm, you know, like that I could put in there, so that way just later you're humming this melody that you're thinking about this line, it would be this, that Christ wants his people to experience peace no matter what. Christ wants his people, his desire is for his people, those who lovingly follow him, to experience peace, not as a cognitive idea, but as something they experience no matter what. 
This is not detachment or denial like the Eastern philosophies. This is facing the circumstances in life, facing the blizzard of adversity, and knowing that we're going to be okay. Not because there's anything great about us, but that there is something great about him. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace, the peace that he himself enjoys, is offered to us. He doesn't give the way the world gives. He doesn't require from us this cost, this feat, this investment. He says, here it is. It is for you. It's the greatest peace. A reminder that everything is going to be all right. A inner calmness that is there, that is present, despite whatever external circumstances are going on in our world. This is possible. This is available. This is accessible. And we're going to get into how do we apply this in life? How do we appropriate this in our lives? But I think to just jump right into that would be a mistake. Because there's a a more important question that we have to address first. And if we don't address this question, if we don't really grasp the answer to that question, we will always feel insecure about whether or not we can have this peace. And so here's the question. Why does Christ want us to have peace? Why does he want us to have peace so much that he would leave heaven and come here to provide it for us? Us, broken, flawed people who have spent, if in our honest moments, to look back in our track record and see that the majority of our decisions were actually very self-focused as opposed to God-focused. That it was a lot about, what am I going to get out of this? What's best for me? Not so much thinking about how he wants me to live, but what is the way that is most fun for me, most pleasurable, most enjoyable, the least amount of difficulty? What is the path of least resistance? That's what I want to go. And so all of us go down that path. We're geared towards that path. We, we lean towards that path. And we do things from time to time throughout our lives that we know are offensive. We think that we can just repay him back with a few good deeds. How does that work? I've never found anybody who's actually tried to keep track. (laughs) Like, oh, yesterday I did 36 bad things, but today I did 40, and I guess it's a one-to-one ratio. Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't even work logically that that's a possibility. So we can't pay it back. We've done all these broken things. Why would Christ offer us peace? These people who have gone astray. The Bible goes so far to say that we were hostile in mind towards God, which is essentially, here's two fingers for you. That was our posture in our deepest, darkest, most honest moments looking inward. That is the default nature of our human race. So why would Christ give us peace? Love. Love is why he wants his people to experience peace no matter what. This should always astonish us. I will never not say that here because the moment that God's love for us, in spite of everything I just said, becomes common or plain or bland or not moving, there's going to be problems. John 15, verse 9, Christ says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. That is a remarkable line, that the quality of love that the Father has for the Son is the same quality of love that the Son has for those who follow him. Those broken people who have chosen so many of the wrong things, who have gone to the inadequate versions of peace for the far majority of their life, his response to those people is love? Yes, God loves you and me. Anyone who follows Christ is loved by God. That's why he sent Christ to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the beloved Son that no matter who you are or what you've done, that if you believe in him, you would never perish, never experience judgment, but rather you would have eternal life. Send Christ to be the light of the world who would draw all people out of darkness and into his light. He'd be the good shepherd who would lay down his life for his sheep, that he would be the resurrection and the life, that whoever believes in him, even if he dies, yet will he live. To be the way, the truth, and the life, because nobody comes to the Father except through him. Love. Christ comes down here and he lives a life of perfect obedience to God, perfect righteousness, perfect holiness. You and I are not on that level. And he offers us this great trade where he says, this is my right standing, my relationship with the Father, and I offer that to you if you will just surrender the broken life that you possess. 
He takes our judgment and we take his righteousness, which means we can have a relationship with God, which means we can have peace no matter what. It is the will of Christ, it is the desire of Christ, it is the want of Christ that his people would experience peace no matter what. The greatest peace, an inner calmness that is there no matter what is going on externally. So the question then becomes, how do we do this? Because if we, if we move on from that why, if you don't believe that God genuinely loves you despite even the worst things that you've done, you've thought, you've participated in, if we don't believe that, then we will never fully trust the peace that he offers. This has to come first. And when we believe that and we build our lives on the love of God, then it opens up the avenues to a peace that is available at all times. Because we know that God's not dishing it out based off of our performance. I had a rough week, John. Guess what? No peace. It's not how God operates. So how do we do this? How do we do this when the bills are getting tight? How are we doing this when, when we've lost our job? How, when we've lost the relationship? How do we do this when our kids are making choices that concern us and worry us? How do we do this when our marriage is in trouble? How do we do this when we watch the news and we watch TV and we're like, God, I don't know what's true. And I don't know what's going on. And I'm concerned about my country. And I'm concerned about the people around me. And I'm concerned about society. And I can't possibly keep up with everything that's going on and fight every cause and right every wrong. What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to have peace with all of that happening? Has that been anybody else's inner monologue at points of their life over the last few years? Yeah, amen to that. That is true. So here's the How? But just before I say that, I don't want to oversimplify this. Let me just tell you that this season of my life has not been one that has been marked by an incredible experience of peace until very recently. Um, there's been a lot going on in my life. I've been very busy. Um, many of you know my wife. Uh, she owns a daycare. She's running that. Um, I just finished my ordination. Um, so that's, that's finished. We have three kids. Praise God. I had a lot of help with that, and I'm thankful to those people, but it's just been a busy season, and so the temptation has been to become undisciplined in my faith. I'm still reading, obviously, and I'm still praying, but I'm not, I'm not pedal to the metal. I'm not pushing it to the floor the way that I had in the past. I'm kind of just checking some of the boxes, or I had been. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but I'm just not with the same fervor, not with the same passion or the same zeal that has been in other seasons of my life. I've allowed a little bit of undiscipline to get into my life. And in that space, what's happened is a focus on the things that trouble, the things that create fear, right? You know, instead of reading the Bible or instead of spending some time alone with God, it's easy to put on TV, it's easy to read articles, it's easy to let my mind wander into all the things that I wish I had. And then God kind of corrected me from this with a space heater. He didn't speak to me through it, I want to clarify that. There was an audible voice. He didn't drop it on my head or anything like that. What I, what I mean by that he spoke to me through a space heater is something you should know about me is that I like to be warm. I'm a warm climate person. I know some of you lose respect. You're like, oh, that not means you're not tough. I don't, I don't care. Uh, I, I am a warm climate person. I constantly have a conversation with God. Like, you want me to start a snorkeling ministry in Turks and Caicos with my family? I'll go. Like, you just say the word. I will make that sacrifice for you, my Lord and King. Like, I will go there. I will sell seashells by the seashore and just teach people about Jesus while we're snorkeling around reefs. Like, I will do that for you, God. I like the warmth. So as the season starts to change, and my office is in the basement here, um, the, it starts to get a little chilly in my office as I define the phrase chilly. Like, so uh, I have my heater on very early in the year. But here's the reality. If my heater is on the far side of the office... It doesn't really do me much good. It's not the heater's fault. The heater is doing everything that it should be doing. It is offering what it is meant to offer, what it is trying to offer. I am not experiencing what it is designed to give me because I'm not proximate to it, because I'm not close. However, as I get closer to that space heater, and I brought it under my desk, I got this nice little space heater under my desk now, I get to experience all the warmth and, and all of the, the just joy and the comfort that it is designed to give me. And in, in this same way, I think there are plenty of times in our lives, and I know my life recently, where I have not been as proximate to Christ, I have not been as close to Jesus, I have not had the same fervor, I had the same zeal to cling to him. And instead, I found myself just with these distractions and with these other things that will not keep me warm, will not give me peace. 
and they have failed to do so. And so I don't mean to oversimplify this and make it seem like, hey, if you just do this thing, then you never have to worry about anything again because it does take a cognitive sense. It does take investment. It does take an awareness of where we're at spiritually. But our experience of Christ's peace increases based off of our proximity to Christ. Our proximity to Christ increases our experience of Christ's peace. The closer we are to him, the more that we cling to him, the more of that peace we will experience, that inner calm, no matter what's going on on the outside, that that kind of inner serenity and that, that deep awareness and confidence in the fact that everything is going to be all right because God loves me and because his son offers me his peace. There's two things that we are required to do in this passage. Christ has two things that he's doing. We have two things that we're doing. The two things that Christ says, he says, my peace I give to you, peace I leave with you. Those are on him. He's made that clear. Our two parts, the imperatives in this passage for you and for me, what Christ is trying to convey as our role is this. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This word afraid, is a, it's an interesting word. It's not the phobos or where we get the word phobia, where we think of like petrified. And it's, it's a different Greek word that is conveying a fear that leads to cowardice, a fear that prevents us from obeying and following Christ. And so when I see in my life now that I start to move away from Christ's goodness, his peace, when I start to find all these different ways to allow myself to be troubled, when my focus is on all the trouble in my life, in the world around me, then I'm not going to experience as much of Christ's peace. But if I can shift that, if I can reallocate some of that investment and that time from those things, I'm not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater, but some of it back towards my relationship with Christ that will increase how close I am to him. When I cling to him instead of pursuing those other things, my experience of Christ's peace will be far greater. And I know this because this is what happened to me very recently. It was like a switch was turned. And there were three specific things that God was reminding me, and they're right in around this text, that you can have peace if you remember these things no matter what is going on. The first one is that we have peace with the Father, I hit on this a little bit earlier, but uh, Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, he says, Therefore, having been justified, having been made right by faith, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Hear me say this, that the most important thing that you could ever acquire in this life is peace with God. It is the prerequisite for every other kind of peace to experience in this life, is peace with God. The only thing that's going to matter in our lives and in our existence a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, a hundred thousand years from now, is whether or not we had peace with God. And so to know that you have peace with God through Christ, that God looks at you as a son or a daughter, that he loves you, that everything is going to be okay. That is the most important thing that you could ever have in this life and you cannot lose it. That can give us peace. The question is, how often are we tapping into that stream? How often are we drinking from that well? Because if I'm leaning into all the things that I started talking about and all that stuff, I spend so much time in that, where is the time for me to be thinking about the love of God, the peace that I have with the Father? We have peace with the Father. We have peace through the Spirit. That's the second thing. I find it fascinating that Christ is talking about the Holy Spirit so often through this. He's like, don't worry, I'm going away, but you're you're in for a treat. This is what he says uh, in John 14. He says, if you love me, this is verse 15, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate, another helper, another counselor, another friend to help you and be with you forever. Spirit of truth. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul writes, he says that the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of the Spirit, the shadow that the Spirit casts on our lives is love, joy, who's got me? Peace. So one of the primary responsibilities of the Holy Spirit being given to me and to you because of our faith in Christ, one of the main responsibilities that he has is to cultivate peace, to grow peace in our lives. A confidence to know that everything is going to be all right because we are loved by God. But that takes time. Am I allowing for there to be time in my schedule to be before God and let the Spirit work? 
Because like the space heater being on the other side of, <laughs> of the office, I, I kind of had a funny thought this week that God's like, all right, so you're doing all these things. You've got a busy schedule. You've got this going on. You've got that going on. You tell me where you can pencil me in and we'll figure out how to bring more peace in your life. Does that make sense? God's very, very sarcastic with me and it's okay. We've, we've figured out the dance and that's what I need. <laughs> but I have to give the Holy Spirit time to cultivate that peace within me. It's not like it's just going to snap there, although there are these gifts along the way. It's supposed to be a relationship. And no relationship would succeed if it's treated the way we often treat our relationship with God. So there's peace with the Father, there's peace through the Spirit, and lastly, there's peace from the future. I love that phrase. We have to remember the future. It's the reason why I added verse 28 into verse 27 here, because often when I've heard this preached, it just stops at 27. But the good part, the, one of the most amazing parts of this section is verse 28. I'll read it for you again. He said, you heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. This is not our home. This is not how it's always going to be despite what our culture tells us, despite what we can see in front of our faces, there is going to be a day where he comes and makes all things new, where every wrong is righted, where every tear is wiped away, where everything that is broken is fixed. That is a, a truth that we can come back to no matter what's going on in our lives. It is something that I can stand on and bring, bring confidence to me that everything is going to be all right because in the grand scheme of eternity, I know that he's coming back for me and for us. And he's going to take us to that place where there's no more weeping and there's no more sadness and there's no more medicine and there's no more brokenness and there's no more strife and there's no more divorce and there's no more addiction. That place where we get to be with him forever, that is coming. He says this in John 14, the very first thing that he says in this section to his disciples, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. That sound familiar? You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that where I am, there you may be also. It is a fixed date where he is going to come back. I don't know the date, so don't ask me afterwards, but there is a day that is coming where he is going to come back and make all things new. Sometimes it's hard to convey the gravity of that, but I've come to appreciate um, some of the songs, especially the hymns that convey that idea uh, poetically. I, I grew up in a family that they were very interested in. They, they loved the music of this family, the Gaither uh, family band. I don't know if anybody's familiar with them. Not really my cup of tea for most of my life. I was into hard rock music and all that stuff. So like Southern gospel wasn't really, you know, kind of appealing to me. And I recently found out though that one of my favorite songs actually was written by them. Uh, I, I'm starting to come around. Plus my co-leader in my life group, he's a big fan. So he's been, he's been working on me. But I want to read to you just this one verse and chorus from their song. I would sing it, but it's a hard song to sing, and I don't want to do that to you. And then one day, we'll all cross that river and fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know he reigns. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. It's a beautiful song. Amen. Praise God. And it's true. There is a victory. There is a vindication. There is a validation to come. That no matter what your circumstances look like, that you can access a peace that flows from the future. You can access a peace that flows from the spirit. You can access a peace that flows from the truth that you have peace with God. I never saw the movie The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. I'm glad I got it right for this message. But I, so I don't advocate. So don't like rent it later. And if there's questionable material, be like, Pastor John said I was supposed to, I didn't, I'm not advocating that you go home and rent this. But there is a quote that I found to be very, very appropriate. The owner of the hotel at one point says, everything will be all right in the end. And if it's not all right, then it's not the end. Everything will be all right in the end. Why? Because he loves you and he wants you to experience his peace. That is his will. That is his desire for everyone who follows him. 
I want to call the worship team forward as we close, but I want to leave you with this one last illustration. Um, years and years ago, homesteaders out in the upper Midwest would face these incredible blizzards, these legendary storms that were lethal. Uh, they would be on their way to the barn while the storm just to make sure that the animals had farm, and many of them would die on the way back, some of them feet from their house, because the blizzard of adversity was raging. The, the circumstances around them, they couldn't even see. The wind was howling. They couldn't hear anybody calling to them, so they had no sight. They had no ability to hear. They did not know the way back. And so they found the tracks of some of them. They wandered around in circles. Others of them perished just a few feet from their own house, completely unaware that they were so close to salvation. So what some of these people started doing is that at the first sight of the blizzard, they would take a rope and they would tie it from the house to the barn. So that way, as they had to go out and feed the animals in the midst of this blizzard and all this adversity and all this difficulty, they could cling to that rope and keep moving forward. And after they got the animals set up and taken care of, they could continue on their way back and they would cling to this rope and keep moving forward despite the circumstances around them. It didn't change their circumstances. It didn't mean that the storm went away, but it meant that they had something to hold on to that was trustworthy. Something that if they followed it and they, they leaned into it and they trusted it completely that it was going to get them home. And eventually, as they continued to move forward and they clung to that rope, they didn't drift. They didn't let go of the rope. They held to that rope as if their life depended on it. There came a moment where they got to the steps and to the door and inside the house. They got to sit down in the warmth and enjoy the safety and security until the storm was over. Friends, I want to tell you that we've been given a rope to cling to, Jesus Christ. I don't know what you're going through, but if you cling to that rope if your proximity to him increases, if you build your life, if you believe, you embrace that love, you seek out that, pay, that peace through him and through him alone, and you keep moving forward, I promise you that there is going to come a day where the storm's over. You'll have something in the short term, in the immediate, that will give you confidence to know that you're going to be all right because you're loved. And that there will be a beautiful moment where we all get to sit in a nice, warm place, with our Lord and Savior, free of all of the struggles, all of the striving, and all of the sadness in this world. That day is coming, and it is nearer now, the scripture says, than when we first believed. And so cling to Christ and experience the peace that he wills and desires and wants to give you. Let me pray. God, I wanna thank you for your many gifts. Lord, how, how much you love us is unfathomable, but our understanding of it can grow each day. And so God, I just pray that all of us would believe and just build our lives on the fact that you love us so that way we can stop fooling around with these counterfeit pieces, Lord God, and, and we could invest in our relationship with you, God, knowing that everything's gonna be all right because we are loved, knowing that we can have an inner calmness that is there despite our outer circumstances, knowing that we can have peace no matter what. God, let us cling to the rope that is your son. I don't know what our friends here today are going through, God, but I, I've got an idea that it's, it's, it's something difficult, God. Everybody's either going into a storm, they're in a storm, or they're on their way out of a storm. And so God, in the moments where we're tempted to let go of the rope, would you just remind us of your love so that we put both hands back on and we keep moving forward. We thank you and praise you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And all God's people said, amen.
for the victory we have in Jesus name Lord thank you for these songs thank you for the word and we're ready to attack this week ahead of us Lord we ask that you just lead us in Jesus name and the church says amen Centerpoint we love you so much thank you for joining us 
We hope and pray that you have a great week and I'll see you next week and we'll continue our series. God bless.